Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Boost 2020, our very first virtual edition. Jackrabbit has been delivered as a bi-coastal event uh, twice a year, but in late 2019, coincidentally, we made the decision to pivot to a virtual platform in order to reach more clients and friends. And boy, oh boy, we had no idea what was coming in 2020, for sure. What should have been a groundbreaking experience, a virtual conference in the youth activity space, has now transformed into almost an everyday experience for most of you. Even taking into an account of all the webinars and virtual conferences opportunities you've had each, each time this year, uh, we hope we can deliver something unique with Boost, a chance for you to meet with other owners, operators, professionals from a variety of different regions, businesses, and stages of Jackrabbit usage. <clears throat> Gathered together for the next two days are dance professionals, gymnastics and cheerleading operators, swim school owners, and music and theater visionaries. This year, you've all faced unique challenges, but you've all overcome circumstances and pivoted in creative ways. We hope that during your time at Jackrabbit Boost, you're able to take advantage of the company around you and prepare for the new year with a group of people just as resilient as you. Take part in the sessions, be active in the Q&A times, and jump on into the conference networking tool Slack to chat with other attendees, Jackrabbit support staff, and industry experts. We're so glad you've taken the time to join us at Boost. <clears throat> now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Aaron Rayford. Aaron married his high school sweetheart, Carrie, and is a proud father to four children, 11, 9, 7, and 5. He owns and operates multiple businesses with his wife, Carrie, in Virginia. Little Fish Swimming is a multi-location sw swimming lessons company. He also works in real estate investment, building and flipping houses. Last year, he completed approximately 30 projects. In addition to this, he has a passion for small business marketing and development and works with other companies on automating their social media content. And if that isn't enough, he and his wife, Carrie, are juggling all of that from the road this year. They are living full-time in an RV, that's right, you heard me, living full-time in an RV and visiting all 50 states. And yes, um, they're doing it with their four children, which is awesome. And they are, um, all their businesses, including Little Fish um, from the RV as they travel as a family together this year. Uh, today, Aaron is presenting a keynote session entitled High Challenge Equals High Reward. High Challenge Equals High Reward. And we could not be more excited to welcome him and pass the mic. Enjoy the opening session with Aaron and the rest of Booth has to off Boost has to offer you this year. And I'll see you tomorrow at the live Q&A. Wow, thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate that introduction, and um, I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys. Um, and I know we have people tuning in from all over the U.S. We've got the West Coast and the East Coast. So if you're with us this morning, uh, put in the chat uh, where you're listening from. I'm very excited to share with you. Um, I'm so thankful for this opportunity. Thank you, Jack Rabbit, for having me. I've been... Um, benefiting from Jackrabbit's um, business solutions for uh, many years now. Um, and we've attended 
I think three or four boost conferences. Um, and so, uh, I'm very thankful for all that they offer and all that they do. But beyond that, um, I just love the the relationships that we've been able to build while we are there, uh, meeting other business owners and meeting Jackrabbit staff. Um, it really has become uh, uh, a relationship thing more than a, than a business thing that has um, gone beyond the conference. And so this is a, a, a huge testament to that. Um, thanks for inviting me to share some of what I've learned. Um, 2020 has been uh, an incredible year. Um, it's been unprecedented, um, as we've heard. Um, I miss being able to get together in person. We had um, our staff at the Jack Rapid Conference last year. We had a blast. Um, we always like to have fun there. Um, and I always enjoy hearing from the speakers. So it's kind of surreal to kind of be one of those this year. Um, um, and so I'm so thankful for that. Um, I don't want to um, minimize the the difficulty that a lot of people have faced this year. 2020 has been um, very hard. There's people that have experienced loss. There's people that have um, experienced um, really difficult times in business. Um, and there's people who haven't made it. And so I don't want to um, just gloss over that. We have empathy for that. But I also, on the other side of that, want to say um, congratulations to those of you who are listening today. Um, if you're in a small business and you're at the Jackrabbit Conference in December of 2020, um, that means you've made it through some very difficult times. And to be able to say that today you're, you're here and we're here together working on how to grow our businesses, that's huge. So um, I feel honored to be able to share just anything with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Mark said, my, my, the title of my keynote today is High 2020 High Challenge Equals High Reward. And I really believe that, um, that where there is difficulty, there's opportunity. Um, so I want to get right into it. It's been a year of first for me, as it has for you. It's been my very first ever pandemic. Um, I don't know if they're giving out badges for that, but we definitely uh, received that one this year, our very first worldwide pandemic. This is something I think they're going to be talking about. They'll be talking about us in history books where, where we've read about the Black Plague and, and all these different things like coming up through school. They're going to be talking about us and how we survived and how there wasn't any toilet paper at the stores um, and how people had to get creative to survive. Um, it's also the first time our businesses have been forced to shut down, at least in Virginia. Um, we had a time frame where they said, nope, nothing, um, nothing's going to happen. We're doing a, an absolute shutdown, which is very difficult. It's also the first year of homeschooling for my wife and I and our four children, which has presented a challenge um, in itself because we are, we love our children, um, but we also love working. Um, and so having to figure out how to get our stuff done and their stuff done has been uh, fun uh, and, and rewarding. We're learning, uh, we're relearning math. I'm relearning how to do multiplication. And, and, and I mean that literally because I don't know what type of math they're teaching these days, but uh, I'm still trying to, still trying to get there on that one. And as Mark mentioned, it's our first year living full time in an RV with a family of six. And, um, that's been quite the um, icing on the cake for this year. Um, this is our RV. Um, I've got a picture of it here. And uh, when we went down to get it, it was just before things really started to kind of take a turn and shut down. Um, but this is us in front of our, our RV. We drove down North Carolina to pick it up with our kids. I never even driven um, anything this size. The, the biggest thing I driven was my car. So uh, it was a challenge to even get it off the lot there. Um, but we've been living in this thing this, this year. Um, we embarked um, around July um, and we, we bought it in May and then did some renovations to it and, and we got in. And a, a little story of kind of how that started. Uh, about five years ago, my wife said, hey, what if we lived in an RV full time? And I said, hey, you're crazy. I can't do that. I've got to work. We've got 
you know, work and, and all these other things. And what about work? And so um, after a lot of prayer and consideration, some of the pros started to kind of outweigh the cons. And so um, we really felt like um, God was leading our family to kind of take an intentional year relationally, um, spiritually, and and it would be a year of, of growing together um, on the road. And because of some of the systems in our business, some of the things that we built within our companies, um, we, we were able to kind of make this a reality and operate our businesses from the road. Um, so I, I'll share a little bit more about that as we go. But um, first, I want to share with you how everything kind of got started for me. Um, so basically, around eight or nine years old, I um, I lived in a dirt road neighborhood, like country boy. Um, and I had a friend down the street and we're hanging out one day and um, we're like, man, we got to make some money. OK, like eight, nine years old. We got to afford our, our skateboards for the skate park. We got to be able to get some candy. What are we going to do, man? And um, my buddy said, well, I know how to cut grass and you're pretty good with a rake. So why don't we start a yard work company? I'm like, That's a great idea, man. This is going to be great. What do we call it? I'm like, your name's Austin. My name's Aaron. A and A yard work. Let's get it. So <laughs> I run home, you know, and I get on the computer. I think we were using paint or like clip art. It probably looks similar to this little image I have here, this guy cutting grass. And I was so excited to make the flyer. I was the creative guy. And so I made the flyers. We printed off a bunch, got on our bikes, rode around our dirt. Uh, dirt road neighborhood and, and delivered all these flyers and then we went home because this was pre cell phone and we waited for the phone to ring so i'm sitting i'm waiting the phone did ring we had some customers call us we had some referrals probably from our moms and we started off strong we were uh cutting grass raking leaves i remember we raked out this lady's entire backyard it was like at least an acre or something it was crazy and i don't know what we got we probably got paid like 60 bucks for that something like that but it was awesome. We were rolling in the in the clients. We were rolling in money, and we had done it. Unfortunately, we had to dissolve that company um, not too long after our third or fourth job because Austin came to me and said, hey, man, like I was talking to my mom, and she says that I need to get a little bit more of the money because you know we're using up my mom's gas, and we got to be able to pay for that. And I said, hold up. Wait a minute. Something's not right because I'm raking just as hard as you are. I'm cutting the grass and uh, I think it should, it should be equal share. So um, long story short, we had to dissolve the company. We went our separate ways. You know, I went my way, you know, we're amicably obviously, but I will say to this day, I'm very thankful that I married an accounting major. Uh, so she could explain to me things like overhead and expenses and things like that. Remember, I'm I'm the creative one. I'm the marketing guy. And so those things didn't come as naturally at first. But it definitely planted the seed in my heart to be able to start something and be able to uh, cultivate and kind of solve a problem, which leads me to my next point. Um, entrepreneurs equal problem solvers. I'd love to say this. Um, I'm going to put it on a T-shirt, I think and wear it around. But down to your core, what you do in business is solving a problem for somebody. And um, so so I love to think of it that way. Um, for Little Fish, the problem that we're solving is we're providing the best lessons experience. And I say it all the time, it's in our it's in our training material, it's in our marketing material, it's it's part of our staff meetings, it's the lens in which we contextualize everything we do. Um, and so, but a lot of people say best lessons experience. What does that mean? What that means is that when people come to the pool, we want to smile on their face. When they leave the pool, we want to smile on their face. Um, all the way down from our six month olds to our adults, to our stroke and fitness classes. Um, everything that we do for students, parents, and our staff, we want it to be an all encompassing experience and this is not something supplemental that we do like a gym or other programs or competitors kind of in our space right we're all in on swim lessons which means we can do it better um, and more quality and a better experience um, than anyone else and when you when you're giving a, a service you know I, I love to think of it 
as not like an exchange, just an exchange where it's like, give me your money. Okay, here's your swim lessons next, you know, and kind of drive through status. We want people to um, look forward to the conversations that they're having at the pool. So that's the problem that we solve, um, providing the best quality lesson possible. But what about you? Your business also solves a problem, and there's a reason that you got started, whether it's from a passion or a need. Um, you may uh, have a different niche that you're involved in. But regardless of what it is, 2020 was the year that tested all of our problem-solving skills, um, for sure. So um, I want to share with you some of those um, things that I've learned this year um, and how I think we can apply those problem-solving skills to not just the next pandemic or anything like that, but any problems that we face or challenges or projects that we face as small business owners, entrepreneurs. So the first thing that, um, that I have is how to remain calm during a pandemic, right? Um, this is a really important one, I think, because we're all living through one currently. Um, it's important because uh, you're not always going to see what's coming. And when it does, you need to be able to react appropriately. So I think we can apply this to future problems. Um, but step number one is to keep a clear head, right? Try not to overreact, stay positive, right? Hey, we're being mandated to shut down and we can't do what we know how to do, what we're best at. Um, what's the what's the positive, right? We're not able to do our thing, but maybe we can tend to some other things that we've been neglecting or plan for when we are able to. Um, your business needs you the most during this time. Um, everyone in your organization I'm sure during this situation where you had to shut your doors, um, if you did, we're looking to you as the leader uh, or a leader of your company and saying, what are we going to do? And if you're running around with, you know, like a chicken with your head cut off, like, I don't know what's going to happen, um, then that's not what's healthiest, I think, for your company. So keep a clear head, stay calm. That's step number one. Step number two is um, take the time to evaluate your options. Um so a big part of that was like, what are the requirements, right? As we were um, getting information from the government, from our governor, we had to really tune in and say, all right, what is being required of us in order to operate? You know, phase one, nothing because we were shut down. Um, you know, we had to be in tune with that. The second thing was, uh, what's our competition doing? Is, is everyone shut down? Is it really worldwide or is it county based? Um, we were kind of evaluating that. Um, another thing to consider during that time while you're evaluating is how are your customers feeling? If you are in an environment where everyone is very scared, they're very concerned, and you want to be the patriot that's saying, hey, you know, no one can tell us what to do. This is America. That might not be the right time for that, the right timing for that message for your customers. It may not serve you well in the future. And so having empathy and care for how your customers are feeling becomes really important during that evaluation. I have the tendency to act too quickly in uh, our organization. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our newer programs is called uh, Stroke and Fitness, and it falls underneath the lesson, swim lessons category. Um, swim lessons is the big umbrella, but underneath that we've got stroke and fitness. And, um, that's for like swim team age, uh, swimmers who may not want to join a swim team. That's a, a really big, uh, commitment. Um, and so I had a lot of summer swim parents who were asking me one year, Hey, we really need a program for our, our students to kind of keep their skills up and practice kind of like a team. So I was like, no problem. We're going to get that started right away for you. Um, and so I go back to my team all fired up like, yo, this is how it's going to look. You know, this is how the flyer is going to look. It's going to look amazing. It's going to have clip art. Um, we're going to deliver them. And uh, all of my team was like, hold up. We need to take some time to evaluate what's the cost going to be. Um, how do we staff it? When are we going to offer it? What are the details here? How do people register for it? How do we incorporate it in Jackrabbit? So all of those things um, were important at that time. So it's important to take the time to evaluate um, your options. But 
once you have evaluated thoroughly your option, then it's time to take action. You have to take the first step. And I've got a picture here that reminds me of that all the time. Stepping up to the starting blocks at a pool, every swimmer starts their race the same way. Swimmer, take your mark. They have to step up and they begin their race. Um, and so you got to take the first step after you've evaluated. When all of this went down um, and we were in quarantine mode, there was so much amazing content going, going on. Um, we were kind of like, hey, is this kind of like a, a free vacation? Like maybe this is going to be so bad. One of the uh, my favorite COVID-19 memes was, I think it said like, don't screw this up. All we have to do is sit on the couch in our pajamas and watch Netflix and we get to save the world. Let me know if you saw that one um, or, or, if, or if you, you saw some funny memes um, during that time. I was rolling um, during that time frame and it was kind of good to have a little bit of comedic relief during that time. But people were getting creative. They were crafting at home. We did some home workout videos um, with the kids, which was fun. Um, but how long could that last? You know, like how long could we actually just sit and do nothing and our businesses be okay for it? Um, you have to take action at some point. Um, I have a friend who um, was a former Marine and he tells this story all the time. I love it. He was deployed and, you know, the Marines that were underneath him, um, it was kind of a known thing that uh, you needed to wear your protective gear, your flak jacket even when you're on base, like even if you're not in the middle of combat, you had your protection on just in case, in case an RPG came in or an unforeseen attack, you needed to be ready. And so he'd have some guys that would get a little complacent and they'd say, Oh, come on, man. I'm just going to the bathroom. I'm just going to the mess hall. I'm just going to work out. And he'd say, no complacency kills. And you need to get your flak jacket on because you need to be ready. And so in the same way, uh, we couldn't be complacent um, on the couch the whole time. We had to be ready and take action. Um, waiting too long during that time frame could have proven fatal for our business, you know, especially when everyone's looking, you know, hey, when are you going to be open? What do you offer? Um, and so that can be overwhelming. And a lot of people want to know, okay, but how do I get started at that point? Um, for us, you, there was a lot of steps involved. Um, and we had to remember not to get too overwhelmed. Um, our steps, what we, what we, how we like stayed sane during that time is actually just writing down our steps. And so here's actually our steps that we wrote down during that time frame. Number one was evaluate the government regulations. They were changing weekly, I think. Um, we needed to devise a spacing plan in the pools at our locations that allowed us to have proper spacing for our classes, um, good social distancing. Um, and there you can see our chart at the uh, upper right hand corner of one of our locations um, where we kind of color coded everything, got that out to the parents, showed how people were going to enter and exit. Um, we also had to purchase new equipment. So I'm sure everyone bought their fair share of hand sanitization uh, devices, um, temperature gauges, um, seating markers. Uh, one thing that we wanted to do, you know, outside of you know, just putting tape on the bleachers was actually mark and designate spaces where it was safe to sit and stay distant. So uh, we did that at the pool there. Um, we needed to draft an email detailing our plan and our approach to our parents. We had to communicate properly um, to our customers. What are we going to do? How does it fall in line with the guidelines? All of that. Um, and we needed to train our entire staff that had been sitting during quarantine waiting for this on what we were going to do. We had to wear masks now. How do we practice hands-off training as much as possible? And lastly, we had to pray that all of those steps happened and that it went well. Um, all of that list, if you look at it all at once, it becomes very overwhelming. But as a good reminder, every mountain is climbed the same one step at a time. Um, so you may make your list and be overwhelmed by the quantity of steps that you have. But if you just take the first one, a lot of times that might lead you to the next one, to the next one. This is a picture of us, um, our family trip this year to the Badlands in South Dakota. Let me know if you've ever been there um, in the chat. But uh, there was an amazing hike right off the start. And we noticed this guy up on top of the mountain. And like, how the heck did he get up there? And you notice this little trail going off to the right. And um, 
So after evaluating and saying, look, we want to get up there, we had to just start the task of heading up the mountain. And so one step at a time, we made it up there, we got our selfies. Um, but it's a great reminder, I think, of how we can approach multi-step processes in our business and in our life, really. The second thing that this pandemic situation kind of showed us uh, was how to keep our eyes open for opportunities. And um, so there's a couple things to, to kind of think about there. Um, when this hit, um, there were opportunities for small businesses. And had we kind of been complacent and not paying attention, we might have missed something like the PPP. Um, you might have taken advantage of some of that support that came out and um, been able to apply. But if we hadn't known about it, we might have been late, not gotten kind of one of the first rounds or the second round. Or, and, and, and that became vitally important for us to support our team. Here's a picture of our team at one of our outings. Um, you know, that glisten on my forehead there, that's because when I go to Sky Zone with my team, I'm not a sideline supporter. You know, I'm on the trampolines busting the backflips, doing the trade. I'm, I'm kind of the energizer bunny of our team. So I have to be on point with that. But these are the guys that we consider to be family, right? So during this time when we couldn't work, they couldn't work, we want to be able to support them. And so small business support becomes important to be aware of. Uh, we're also a seasonal cycle. Um, there's a seasonal cycle for our business. So even though we operate year round and all of my swimmers – um, all my, all my swim lessons companies will know what I'm talking about here. Um, people think swimming when, when there's warmer weather, like they sign up and they almost cram for the test. Oh shoot. Summer's here. I need to learn how to swim. Like in two weeks, you know, we get calls all the time. How, how long will it take? Like everyone's different. You know, we don't limit progress, but we, you know, we suggest you get in a consistent class, all that. Um, but normally during April, May, and June, we profit twenty to thirty thousand in each of those months. Um, that's our busy season, you know. Um, and we had to shut down um, during that time frame. So instead, we went negative twenty each of those months, um, which was very difficult. And if we didn't have something like the PPP, that would have been even more difficult. Um, so it's vitally important to stay in tune with what's available for your business um, during situations like this. And I want to do a micro plug for Sean Deaver. I don't know if Sean Deaver is watching, but I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to Sean at the Jackrabbit conferences. And um, basically when this first came out, Sean Deaver was on point with some suggestions on, you know, laying people off or not um, the PPP, what did it all mean? And so he was a great example of being ready um, and looking for opportunities in that time frame. Um, the other way to evaluate your opportunities is through your competition. So here's how to be proactive with that. And I've kind of changed to try to have a, a healthier mentality uh, with competition over the years. I mean, when, when kind of I first started getting into business, it was sort of like a secretive, um, you know, you know, butting heads competition sort of vibe. But now, um, I feel like it's more of uh, just an understanding of what they do and what you do and what makes you different. Um, if you can't pinpoint your differentiator, then you may want to figure that out because I think that's what gives us confidence over our competition. If someone called you today and said, hey, why should I choose you over someone else? Um, you need to have those answers ready. But you want to evaluate your, uh, your competition's uh, performance. And one way that we help businesses do that is um, – through social media, you can evaluate exactly how their performance is, what posts they're doing, how many people are engaging with it. And you can look and see what are they saying during this time? Are they saying that they're open, they're closed? Um, the other thing, the way to be proactive in evaluating that is running a yearly pricing report. So if you're working in your yearly pricing increases like you should, Sean Deaver, um, then you want to make sure you're not pricing yourself out of the market. So if someone else is holding strong at this, you know, entry level price point and you go too high, that might be an issue. So we do that every single year so that we can know where we fall. And, you know, if we're providing the best lessons experience, we want to be able to be priced appropriately for that. Um, but also you can know how your um, competition is doing 
during a pandemic. Um, you don't want to get mislabeled during a time like that. So I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you are saying, hey, we're staying open, we're here for you no matter what, and your competition is saying, hey, we love you guys so much, we wish we could be open, but we want to put your safety first, you can see how that may cast a negative light on your business. Even though you may have the best intentions and you might be accurate in your market, you want to make sure that there's not that contrast going on that could be harmful to your business. Um, but you can also see how they're handling customer concerns. How are they doing the face masks? How are they doing their online classes? A lot of people were providing extra value um, during that time frame with crafts and classes online. We're a swim company. So I'm going to tell you right now, I could not figure out a way to provide swim lessons and continue to charge people during the pandemic on Zoom. Um, that would have been fun to see and maybe to attempt, but we just decided to go the safer route and do things like the little fish move. So for a period of time, we had a workout that people could do every single day and educate them, especially for people who were homeschooled. That was good for their PE class. So we, how do we add value during that time? That's what we did. Um, but alternatively, your your competition might not be addressing concerns well, and they might not be doing so well during the pandemic. And it never hurts to ask. So we noticed that about one of our competitors during this time frame that there was kind of like ghost town over there. There was no movement, not a lot of social media engagement going on, not a lot of posts going on. And so we made a phone call to the leasing space there and found out that it was available. And so through keeping our eyes open for opportunities during that time frame, we were actually able to start the process of maybe adding an additional location. So it's a little bit of a silver lining there, but if we hadn't been watching for it and being proactive, definitely would not have happened. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, the next thing that I have is hope for the best and plan for the worst. Um, so excited to share about this with you. Let me know if you're still with me in the chat. It's a little bit interesting not being in a room with everybody and being able to read the room and see your faces. But if you if you leave a comment in the chat, then I know you're, you're still with me. Um, so hoping for the best plan for the worst, you, you want to plan ahead. And just four um, pretty basic bullet points here. Uh, number one is cash reserves. During this time frame, if we didn't have the support from the things like the PPP and, and support for the small business, um, then it would have been beneficial to have cash reserves at that time. You want to be able to float that uh, time frame, keep your employees on instead of having to start from zero um, after you were able to come back. Good to see all the comments in there. Um, I see you, Chris. Uh, so there's two sides to that, though. Cash reserves, you know, plan to float a bad time, but also in the good times, you know, planning ahead, um, planning for the worst. You can also plan for the best. So if you have cash on hand, you're, that's beneficial if you're going to purchase a new location or, or, or expand because banks are going to want to see that. Um, so uh, step number two here for planning ahead, plan how to grow every year. I will give you our secret to this. We use this conference. Every single year, we've got it on our calendar, and we come and we use the Jackrabbit Boost Conference to have a dedicated time because as business people – we are running around all the time um, and we're handling things day to day. And sometimes it it is difficult to actually sit down and just take the time and the headspace to plan where are we going next. And um, Jackrabbit's been huge for that. We typically come away with one to two things that we can implement and come back next year. Our goal is to kind of have it implemented by the time we get um, to the next Boost Conference. So if you're here, you're already doing that step. Um Unlike this kickboard picture at, at our pool, um, you want to build something that's la that's going to last. Um, what I mean by that, in and in terms in the context of planning ahead, if there's an aspect of your business that is impossible to run without you there, then you may want to begin to kind of evaluate some of those things. How do I support and build a foundation that will last beyond me? And if you operate that way, then then you will receive the benefits of that in the future, whether whether it's now or later. Building something to last is huge. Um, and then number four is diversify. 
So just briefly mentioned earlier, we're also in real estate investment. That's something that I kind of have had a background in and we've dabbled in and kind of gone more more all in on this year um, or the past few years. But if you have something that you're good at or that your company allows you to consider a little offshoot of, then that helps you to not have all of your eggs in one basket per se. Um, so I think those are all good things. And um, another way to hope for the best and plan for the worst is to stay current. I know that a lot of people, when this hit and we had to go to Zoom, no one knew what Zoom was. This wasn't the time to start a Facebook page and start an Instagram page from scratch. Like, If you had already been online, you're posting relevant content, um, then you benefited um, from that because you were able to engage with your customers still, even though the doors were closed, we kept the lines of communication open. So you have to be able to stay current. So one of those ways that we do that is with social media. And um, I, I have a passion for, for working with other businesses and, and doing that. I think it's the creative side of me. I just like to create. I like to try new things. But it's the billboard versus the watering hole mentality. What does that mean? So a lot of people create posts on their social media pages with the intention of people driving by. And driving by looks a little bit different on your phone. It's like this. You just swipe right past. And so um, a watering hole mentality is you're posting something with the intention of people coming in, having a drink, sitting down for a while, enjoying, interacting with, sharing. Um, I always tell some people on my team, let's create things that people just can't help but share. Um, and that's sort of a different approach. A lot of people think, hey, I posted something on my social media last week and nobody saw it. Well, that's because social media has an algorithm attached to it. You know, Facebook is based off of engagement and attention and interaction. So if people aren't liking, commenting, sharing your posts, then a lot of people that even if you have a, like, a bunch of likes or follows on your page, a lot of people might not see them because they limit that because they're smart. Um, but the way that you uh, overcome that is consistency, having posts that are relevant and current, um, and also keeping up with that is almost a full-time job. So TikTok, number four. Um, I always think about Facebook when I think about TikTok because when I was in, I think it was like 10th grade, I had somebody ask me, hey, what are you on Facebook? What's your Facebook? I'm like, I'm not on Facebook. I'm on MySpace because Facebook is for college students. And I had a lot of attitude with it too. And um, basically, if you look at Facebook now, I think all of my friends' grandparents are on it. Like it, it stems from young to old. Everyone is on there. Okay. And so now it's fully, it's fully engaged. Um, and so newer platforms like TikTok, right. Where everyone says, Oh, that's just for the kids. That's just for, I'm not going to get on there. And that, that, you know, that's, that's not for me. Well, your future customers are on there. And so for us, for little fish, it may not be, um, someone that's ready or has a kid right now, but it, but if we're on there, we are engaging with those people as that platform gets older, just like Facebook did. And as people continue to use it, just like Facebook, um, that we'll be the ones that were relevant, that have the following, that understand how to use the platform instead of having a huge learning curve and starting from scratch way later in the game. So just a little challenge for anyone who kind of has that mentality. If you don't know how to do it, then you know, hire someone that does know how to do it. And even if it's just a little bit, then you're kind of prepared instead of having to play catch up. So always be ready. Um, so I've shared a few things so far, a few, you know, notes of things I've learned. And this next one um, is called systemizing your business. I'm very excited to share this part. I think it has huge application. If you are a note taker, um, this, there will be a lot of tips here. Hopefully applicable things that you can do in your business right away. Um, I know we've done it and it's been a huge part of why we're able to operate our businesses from the road this year. So I'm really excited to share this. So first I'll start with a story. Um, we were at a family vacation and um, we were in the hot tub. It was like a family reunion. We were in a hot tub with one of Carrie's um, cousins, just hanging out, talking business, talking shop. 
And I think we were explaining some difficulty we were having. You know, we had high employee turnover rate. You know, people were being hired and, and leaving before we could even really get momentum. We had a lot of last minute emergency call outs and difficult things we were navigating. And he said, Dallas said something to us that really struck a chord. Um, and he said, does your business work for you or do you work for your business? And I don't even know if he was just messing around, but immediately for me, light bulb went off. And I said, you know what, we definitely work for our business. So, you know, entrepreneurs, they're problem solvers, but you can start a business and really just trade, you know, one job for the next. Um, like I mentioned, if, if you're, if, if it doesn't work without you there, then, then you may want to ask yourself the same question. So, but a lot of people talk about systemizing. So how do I systemize my business? And so we had to figure out how to start that process. Starting the process um, looked like this for us. I'm gonna be straight up. It was starting with Jackrabbit. Um, we were on the fence, Jackrabbit. Um, we were on the fence for a while. I'd say like a couple years we knew, um, but here's, here's the thing that really, I, I think landed the plane for us. We were on, uh, we had certain things that we did in our business. Well, our business does this specific thing, this specific way, and Jackrabbit can't do that. So that doesn't work for us. And, you know, so we made a lot of excuses where Jackrabbit had all of these things that could help us. Um, but because of this one thing over here, we weren't willing to kind of pull the trigger on that. And so we were in spreadsheets. We were typing in, you know, makeup lessons, and we were looking for classes manually and um, handling registration and payments and, you know, five different things and so that was a full-time job and and anytime an email hit there was like a 10-step a process on how to handle that jackrabbit was a solution that allowed us to automate all of that and really take the business to the next level and we had a compromise on very few things for the much larger benefit um but for you how do you start the process for you because all of us here we we utilize jackrabbit maybe you're not utilizing it to the fullest I'd encourage you to explore how to how to do that and how to get the most out of that tool. But um, the way to really evaluate it is to write down what you do every single day. And that sounds like a nightmare, but um, it, it really is the answer. So creating to-do lists um, by writing down what you do gives you a visual um, way to uh, see every aspect of what you do. Um, here's a little snapshot of one of my to-do lists, right? I've got the day, the category, and the tasks. And these are the things, um, uh, the day, the company, and the task. And so these are the things that I need to make sure that I do. If, I, if I'm not doing these things, then my company suffers for it. And so for you, you need to make that list, even if it takes one week, a month, a year, make that list, determine, you know, as you go, okay, I've got a pretty good list. If you're doing anything that's not on that list, then... It needs to be added to the list. Oh, I forgot that I always do this on Wednesdays. Boom, put it on Wednesday. And before you know it, you have a long list of exactly what you do. Step two is take a look at that list and say, okay, on here, is there anything on here that someone else could do, right? For, for me, the non-negotiable is payroll, right? I don't want anyone else in charge of handling the money and making the payments because if errors are made, I'm not aware of them. It could be a costly error. Um, but other things um, like running a report every single year of competitor pricing um, can be allocated to someone else. So as you start to see those that divide, here's the only me things, here's the things that I don't have to do someone else could do, you start to kind of see, okay, maybe there's like a part-time or full-time job here. And the, the difficulty there is like, I don't know if I want to, you know, have the additional overhead of hiring that person. Well, thankfully, um, you know, we had the same question and we tested that. So one of the things was our sales position at Little Fish. And we knew we had all of these sales funnels coming in from our website. It automatically grabs people who are interested in swim lessons and we get an email. So that's pretty valuable, but we aren't able to on our own with all the other things, all the other to do's thoroughly, um, follow up with those leads. You know, what it looks like is sort of like a CRM where it's like, okay, they get a first email. Thanks for your interest. Did you have any questions? You know, two days later, shoot a text message, you know, four days later, you know, whatever your process is, 
we wanted somebody to kind of handle that all the way through to the finish line. And so we hired for it and we found that that position more than paid for itself. And so we're using that as a model to go forward as we build us our sales system out even more, but let that be an encouragement to you. If you have some of those things, um, that can create time margin for you to leave you free to do the things that only you can do. Um, the next thing that we did, and this actually started sort of, I think last year on the tail end of last year's Jackrabbit conference, we wanted to automate our training. So we got all of our systems, our registration, but one of the things we noticed that was inhibiting our growth, like if we were to copy and paste our location, I would have a lot more people to train. And we were dealing with, okay, we've got this many people trained, they're in, oh, we have more demand, we need more employees. So I'd have to start the process all over again, reading them, the same policy manual, going over the same things with them over and over and over and over and over again. And so we said, look, this is crazy, let's write it down and film every aspect of this training. And what that allowed us to do is train people remotely and train people online, which was good for COVID-19. Um, and then take a seven day training in person to a two day online. And then obviously they have to do the in water portion, but systemizing that whole thing allowed us to um, really take our, our, our systems to the next level. It was a year long process of all of that, but it was well worth the time investment because now we can, we can, if we were to open another location today, we could train the entire staff within two weeks and have it ready to go. Um, the next thing uh, in terms of systemizing your business, and I've heard a lot of people mention this before at Jackrabbit Conference, so I hope there's some people um, here um, who are interested in KPIs because, as you can see, I am. Now, I have to put on my glasses like really hard to, to focus on tracking and KPI numbers because, like I said, I'm the creative guy. Remember that story about the whole yard work thing? Well, this is how hard I have to concentrate. But, like I said, I have help with that on my team. But... The number one thing that we track is parent feedback. Some of you guys might do that um, through like an email sort of thing. We have found that doing the email yields a much fewer, uh, a lower percentage of answers um, to how people, um, you know, would rate your their experience with you. And we track parent feedback every single month, and I want to tell you why. Um, I attended a uh, gymnastics. There was a gymnastics. I'm not hating on gymnastics. I love gymnastics. I used to do parkour. So before you start judging me on gymnastics, I can do a punch front, you know, flip and maybe not hurt myself. But um, I went to a gymnastics place with my daughter. We were unhappy with some of the things, and um, you know, we pulled a, we pulled her out, and we did not continue. I did not receive a phone call. I did not receive an email. I did not receive a text message any form of communication asking how my experience was or, you know, you know, even attempting to try to get me back. That is valuable dollars walking right out of their studio. And so we didn't want that to happen for Little Fish. So we do every single month, we get our feedback manually, we get it into tablets, it goes in and it calculates percentages for all of our instructors on the metrics we want to see. So we want to see how friendly our staff is, how they would rate their class, how they'd rate their uh, deck manager, how they'd rate their professionalism. Those different metrics might look different for you, but it's important information and it can be turned into data that drives your company in these sort of ways. You can use the information for performance reviews. So if you have them for every single one of your coaches, every single month you can bring your uh, part-time employees in and you can give them a salary type benefit of receiving feedback and knowing how they're doing by saying, hey, you were in the green percentage this month for friendliness, great job. I noticed that we had a slight fall in your teaching ability and that kind of comes across in your subbing or your passing percentage because you didn't pass as many people here. So maybe parents are saying, hey, we'd really like to see more progress and so I'd like for you to try to work on that next month. You don't have to have your employees guessing if they're doing well or not. This gives them an actual metric to um, follow. So um, so I think it's important. We all have part-time employees, and, and to give them that sort of feedback, sometimes we forget that helps them to know, I'm doing good. I'm going to stick around here because I'm, I'm going to climb the ladder, become a manager. Or on the other side of that, you don't have to fire people. Um, we've 
probably fired only a handful of people, maybe two people in the 13 years we've been doing Little Fish. And that's because they know they get three reviews in a row that just say, Hey buddy, uh, really, you know, we talked about this last time and I'm not seeing an improvement and we really need to. Next thing you know, you get an email that says, Hey, I just don't think this is working out and say, Oh man, we're wishing you well, you know, and that's just better. Um, cultivating five-star reviews. Here's a hack real quick. Um, if you get all of these comments from your feedback at the end of the month and there's five or six people on there that are rate going out of their way to add notes like not just saying, hey, you're a 10 out of 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, right? But saying like, my child couldn't swim. They were deathly afraid of the water. And now they can't wait to come to lessons. Boom. I'm sending them an email right away based on that parent feedback metric to say, hey, thank you for your feedback this month. It helps us to continue to provide the best lessons experience. And um, would you mind giving that a similar review on Facebook and Google? That would really help. For those of us who get those random, um, you know, one-star reviews that we really didn't deserve, they were just a bad reflection or, um, you know, just maybe a mishap on our part, this can help to turn that curve upward. Um, the next thing that we track is the length of time students stay. All right. If you know how long people are staying, you know how much you can pay to get them. So the cost of acquisition. All right. So if, if radio ads cost me $1,000, but I know someone's going to stay X amount of time, I can justify that that cost if I know what the return is going to be. Um, you know, a lot of people struggle with discounts. I don't want to give people a discount. Well, if someone, if you knew on average that your students stayed six months on average and you got a hundred dollars per student, you know, would you give someone 50% off of their first month? So give someone 50 bucks at a hundred dollars per student. If you knew you were going to get six out of them on average, $600, the answer is probably yes. So you could probably put together a marketing uh, promotion to advertise 50% off your first session if you knew that. But you have to track that information to be able to know. It can also help with your growth. So if you know how many dollars per average you're bringing in per student, every single student is worth this much on average, then you know how much you need to sustain a new location. So if, if renting a place costs X, and you know you need 300 students to cover that, and you know on average your locations get to 300 students within the first two years, then you have some pretty good metrics there to be able to expand if, it, if it expansion is part of your long-term goal. Um, financials are really important. You have to know profit and loss each month in order to know if you're on track and know if you're making the right calls. If you hired a new marketing hotshot to come in and revolutionize your business, but you're not seeing the growth, you know, then you know, hey, maybe I need to scale back on this. Um, helps you to track that dollars are well spent and um, keep track of your salaries and your overhead so you know where to compensate if you need to. Um, and the other aspect of that is if you aren't there, if you aren't at your physical location, Right, you need to know how things are going when you're gone. Um, you might have a you might have an issue where I think I think this is a worldwide issue. Um, if you're not there, then there is a certain level that it's gonna that performance is gonna drop, right? Because you're the one that's most passionate about your company. You're the one that cares the most about that customer. Um, and unless you've incentivized someone to ownership level. I just don't think employees are going to have the same mentality. So it's really important when you're not there to know how things are going. So if you're evaluating these reports, you're evaluating your financials, you can know like, hey, when I step away, I'm not seeing much of a drop. So, you know, let's continue to invest in, in this area to, to enforce this, or I am seeing a drop in this area and I need to focus on training more, these employees more. It also allows you to not leave your business blindly. So I, I don't... Um, I don't pretend that, you know, leaving your business, getting your business on on training wheels and walking away is the goal because I don't think blindly doing that is is beneficial at least at first. I think you having a part is part of the life of your business. So, being involved in as much to have the vision and the purpose for people to follow, you have to have a vision that's worth following. So you don't want to leave your business blindly, but tracking your KPIs and tracking your financials allows you to vision cast and broadcast, hey, this is where we're going, and be able to regularly communicate with those people. 
as I said um, earlier at the start of this, um, we've been on a year long, uh, or we're in the process of a year long RV, full time RV trip. And we started off heading straight over to Colorado and Utah. Uh, Utah was, I think, still one of my favorite states so far. We're on state number 27. And we're trying to get all 50 states um, this year. Obviously, we'll have to fly to Hawaii if we want to do that. And we'll probably fly to Alaska. But we're on 27. And um, it's been incredible to be able to spend this intentional family time and see things that I've only read about in, in books and only maybe seen in movies. And it's cool to watch the kids' eyes um, as they take in, you know, the, the country that we live in. Um, you know, we went out west and tried to do the north um, east before it got cold. So we went to Vermont and we went to New York and saw the Statue of Liberty. And and so it's been amazing for, for uh, homeschooling. It's been amazing for the family. Um, and, you know, we plan to head west, you know, after the holidays as well. But um, if we didn't have the systems that we have in our business today, then this year wouldn't be possible. You know, there are certain days on our to-do list that allow us to stay connected, stay plugged in, stay working, but also still have um, the freedom to be able to do this. And so you might be asking, what's next um, for us? And that's a good question because we didn't really plan for too much growth this year. Um, we sort of said, look, we've got the systems in place. Let's go. If we have to fly back, we will. We haven't had to yet. Um, but let's just kind of maintain and see what is possible this year with this. And we've been kind of blown away by how productive we've been able to be. We've seen, we've seen growth, even though we weren't planning for too much growth. Like I said, we're in talks about a new location. After that one, we got a phone call about a potential um, another one. And, and then there's a potential uh, summer only site. And so we could be looking at going back and like doubling our location, doubling our workload at the end of all of this. But regardless of what comes our way, uh, the one thing that I do know is that we're going to continue to evaluate things as they come in. We're going to stay calm and uh, evaluate our opportunities, look for those silver linings. We're going to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And we're going to continue to systemize our business um, in order to solve the problems. Um, and so I want to encourage you guys to do the same. Uh, thank you so much for um, for giving me the time for this. If you want to keep up with the family, uh, we're at the Rayfords and we're doing our best to keep up with videos and Facebook and Instagram. And that's a full time job as well, which is I'm not I'm not excelling at uh, too well, but we've got our hands full otherwise. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys to continue um, on the path that you are and continue to systemize. And even if it takes a little bit more effort, it will be worth it on the other side of it because now you have the time margin to be able to build and continue to tweak. And that's part of the process. It's part of the entrepreneurial process that I absolutely love. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can via um, Instagram, race marketing, BA, or email. My email's here, race marketing and promo at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have an amazing time uh, during this conference and that you start taking notes and start building things. Um, if there's time, um, I'd love to be able to answer a couple of questions, um, but I will leave that up to the powers that be. Thank you guys so much. Hey, Aaron, you still there? Still here. Good. Oh my gosh. I was laughing out loud the whole time. You did so good. I love it. We do have a couple of questions. There was a, a couple of themes and we've got a couple of seconds. So do you mind if I throw two your way? That'd be awesome. Yep. So mostly people want to know what system you're using to collect parent feedback. Are you doing it through email or SurveyMonkey? How are you doing that process? Okay, so we have um, we use a system called, and you can do this manually. You can you can do this in um, you can build this out in Google uh, if you wanted to, but it's basically a, a form that's going to collect um, name, email, phone. Uh, sorry, name of the student name of the coach, name of the deck manager, which location they're at, and then we have different metrics. Um, and so we're actually working on systemizing our tool even further, so it's like all in one and all inclusive and easier, not as many steps. That's that's an ongoing trend for me. But we're using something called Zoho. Um, you might be familiar with that, but Zoho Creator is a pretty powerful tool that allows you to build out um, customizable forms. It's a drag and drop situation. 
but you can literally do the same thing in Google Forms. The, the hardest part is figuring out what am I going to track, what am I going to, what, what do I care about finding out, and what are the things that if I know I didn't perform in, I can take an actionable step on um, improving. That's a really good point. I, I always tell everybody, if everything is a priority, nothing's a priority. So keep your surveys concise and really to the point. And like Aaron said, what you guys really care about, because you could ask 50 questions, but can you take action on 50 questions? You know, TBD. Right. So that's good. And then somebody else, Jennifer, had a really good question. How are you tracking the length of time for an average student stay? So... I can, if, if, if you connect with me via email, I can give you some more specifics on that. But we have the, the time that they registered. We have their registration information from Jackrabbit. Um, but behind the scenes, there are a lot of formulas that we've kind of built um, that allow us to automate some of those things. So, and that's part of the process that we're building right now that I think will be a valuable tool for us in the future. And would love to share that with others too. But it, imagine this being able to, collect the feedback in the form and then it's it's live automatically calculating your percentages that then you can go and utilize for those performance reviews utilize for the you know those people that you want to reach out to like if you have somebody that's like for me like part of my job is the the review part because i'm the marketing guy but our general manager they're working on the negative aspect so if somebody it you want to know right away when someone says, nope, you're not a 10 out of 10. You're matter of fact, you are a three, four and five in these areas. That's, that's a nine one one. Like if you don't reach out to that person right away, they probably already exited. They're like, I'm going to just call it quits. I'm going to tell other people that's this, this is bad. So, um, we're building that out to be able to, um, respond to that live action. I love it. And absolutely, we'll make sure that we connect you um, with everybody who's got a specific question. Maybe we need to do an Aaron Rayford masterclass after Aaron Rayford keynote because there's a lot more to learn. But uh, with that, Aaron, I just want to thank you again. This was an awesome keynote. I am jazzed for the, the whole conference, and it was really good to have you here. Oh, thank you guys so much. Can't wait to connect with you and have an amazing conference. Thanks. Well, before we send Aaron on his way, I just want to let you guys know that next up, you've got the breakout sessions. You have time to make another cup of coffee. Uh, don't run to Starbucks, but make a cup of coffee. Do what you need to do. Check in with your staff. We're going to start right at 11.15, and those breakout sessions go to 1 o'clock. So you've got two options. You have Jackrabbit System Deep Dives, and then you have Business Boosting Tips. So two tracks. Um, just remember, if you can't catch them all, they will be on demand as soon as they wrap up, so you can catch them a little bit later. At 1 o'clock, right here on the main stage, I am back with Tracy Egan and Chrissy Dees of our product team, and they're going to show you everything that is coming in 2021 in the Jackrabbit system. You do not want to miss that one. It's going to be just a game changer. And then we've got breakouts again at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So take a break, go find your next session, and I will see you out there. Bye, everybody.